Hi, I'm Chris Toich, a forage extension specialist at University of Kentucky's Research and Extension Center in Princeton, Kentucky. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Western Kentucky Summer Forage Tour. This year's tour is being held at Michael and Stacy Palmer's farm in Callaway County, located near Alamo, Kentucky. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Michael and Stacy Palmer, and they're gonna tell you a little bit about their farm. And I got started farming when I was a kid, and we had a dairy farm. I guess we've been around here since this place has settled, the Palmer's have, but finishing beef on grass is just something that is easy for somebody that thinks about dairy farming can do because you're always thinking about quality when you're milking cows. And <clears throat> when we quit milking in 91, I put in a beef herd and I, I never fed concentrates or none of the things that all the other beef farmers done. I put out mineral and I fed them good quality hay and good grass to graze. And 2011, mm -hmm. we had some heifers that we bred and eight of them come up open. And when we realized they were open, they were finishing. And we've been hearing about this grass-fed beef stuff, you know. And I said, Stacy, you think we can sell them as grass-fed beef? I don't know, we'll see. And we got appointments with the butcher. And that was our first eight that we sold. And I quit selling commercial calves. I didn't sell any more commercial calves after that. We homeschooled our kids, so that's where I started. I put it up on <coughs> Facebook on the homeschool group, and they were gone within, they were all sold within a week, so. We sell by the cut. It's all USDA inspected, and um, it's changed how we've sold over the years, but right now we do pickups from the farm. We deliver to people's homes. Farmer's Market, we do the Murray Downtown Farmer's Market on Saturday. We have a few groups in like Evansville, Indiana, and Mount Vernon, Illinois, like Mom's Health Food Co-op, so once a month we do a big bulk delivery to those places and meet people. There's about 80 acres here <clears throat> on the other side of the road, and there's about 20 here on this plot. And we've got another 50 we lease in Marshall County, and WA's is about 40 at Kirksey. And I don't keep very many mama cows here. I never keep the bull here. I move my cows every quarter to the bull, so I've got four calving seasons, essentially. I do that so that I, I can keep my supply coming steady instead of having two groups a year to kill because you'll, you'll wind up overfeeding them if you have two groups before you can get them through the butcher. All right, today our first stop on the tour is a crabgrass variety demonstration. We've got four varieties of crabgrass planted. I know that sounds a little odd to most people, but crabgrass can actually be a really great and nutritious summer forage. The varieties we've got in the trial today are Mojo, Red River Crabgrass, Dow's Big River, and Quick and Big Crabgrass. All right, so we're standing here with a group of finishing animals. Uh, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about these animals and what they're grazing in this pasture? Well, they're grazing crabgrass. It's Red River, and there's a little, there's a little white clover in it, and a few pigweeds. The cattle are all different ages, from ready to go to market to just been weaned for a couple of months. I, I mix them, I don't keep them separate. I started out keeping them separate to see if it made any difference, and it didn't make any difference. So that's probably one of the things that's a little bit different than a traditional farm. In a traditional farm, we really want to tighten the calving window up so that we have a uniform group of calves to take to the stockyard. But with grass finishing, you don't want all your animals to finish at the same time, right? No, because you don't want to kill them all at the same time. You can't kill them all at the same time. You want you, to have that supply. The, you, right, and you want that staggered. and. If you, if you did two groups, a spring and a fall, the difference in animals will stagger it some, but I went ahead and broke mine up into four Kevin groups. Okay. I don't do as many in the summer and many in the dead of the winter as I, as I do spring and fall, and I do more spring than I do any. But this is good quality forage. You put that up and feed that to some mama cows, they'll stay fat all winter. But we like it out here for the cows, and cows like it. They select it. They go in the field, they'll eat crabgrass. I am a firm believer in rotational grazing. The more you manage your forage, the more forage you're gonna to have to manage. But I also understand that time limitations get, gets a hold of all of us. I mean, these cows here are not on any subdivision in this pasture, and I could divide this pasture infinitely the way I've got the fence fixed. And uh, in the spring when we've got time, we might have this divided up into five or six paddocks, move the fence every day, 
but when we start setting tobacco and making hay and all that, we widen it up so we don't have to move the cows as often. Do you think that rotational grazing improves the production per acre? Rotational grazing improves the production per acre exponentially. Don't skip the fertility. Soil test, keep the P and K balanced, use enough nitrogen to keep it growing. We put 20 gallons of UAN on this about 10 days ago. How many pounds of nitrogen would that be? That would be 60 units. 60 units. Yep. And that's generally, that's stimulating the crabgrass growth right that's now. That's stimulating the crabgrass growth, yep. And does crabgrass like nitrogen? Crabgrass loves nitrogen. It's gonna increase your volume and your quality. This particular pasture will probably get grazed one more time and I'm gonna round up it and put it in ryegrass. Okay. And is there enough crabgrass seed in the soil to come back next year? Yes. But I'll, I'll probably put three pounds in when I fertilize the ryegrass. Are you mixing that right with your fertilizer? I mix it with my fertilizer, put it on in late winter, early winter. Anytime, anytime after it's past germination, you can sow crabgrass seed for next year. Okay. Anytime when it's late enough that it won't germinate, you can sow it for next year. And that's how we actually put that crabgrass demonstration in. We actually broadcast it right over annual ryegrass. And yeah, they put it right over there. And that was in early March, wasn't it? Uh, late, February, late February, I think, yeah. That's when I sold most of mine this year was late February. Yeah. On most of my annual ground, it's rotated in tobacco, so it's going to miss a year of seed every three years. So we just sow a little crabgrass seed every year on that ground because you're not going to get as good a reseeding when you kill it and I'll probably start killing crabgrass in the middle of August, middle of the month, and preparing to sow ryegrass. All right, now we're going to head over to our fencing demonstration today. Uh, we're working with Beckert and Steve Saracen, and they put up a demonstration fence. It's a high tensile fixed knot woven wire fence, probably the best fence on the market today. I'm Steven Sarson from Beckhart, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's called fixed knot woven wire. The unique thing about fixed knot is that the vertical wire is all one piece, and there's actually a third piece of wire that ties a knot. That's why we call it fixed knot. The nice thing about fixed knot is we can use a much higher tensile line wire and a higher tensile stay wire because we don't have to wrap it like we do on a traditional hinge joint. The other nice thing about it is, because it's a high tensile wire, it's lighter, yet stronger, so we can widen out our post spacings. We're gonna put an offset on this, on this wire. Now the offsets that we're gonna use on this side actually wind onto the wire, and so one leg goes on either side, and then your insulator's out here, and we'll run the smooth wire through it. On the other side of the fence, you can't really see it. We use a different kind of an offset that nails actually into the wood post, and then you put a staple in underneath that to keep it from twisting. Either one of those will work. Then we'll electrify that, and that keeps your animals from rubbing against the fence and, and getting against it and, and working the fence. And, and what we'll do if we want to divide this fence, let's say we wanted to go out this way and divide this, we can use what they call poly wire, and we'll just tie the poly wire onto a gate handle, and just once we're ready to electrify it, we can use some step-in posts, small posts, you don't have to use a lot of heavy posts, and you just bring that gate handle over, you snap it onto that hot wire, and your poly wire is electrified. And you can make any size, shape, pasture that you want to do. So Michael's got some pretty innovative things going on at the hay storage area. He's actually used recycled barge tops to create a roof for his hay storage shed. The heart of Michael's stored forage program is actually annual ryegrass silage. And he feeds that during the winter months. That's a very high quality forage um, that can allow him to get good average daily gains on calves during the winter months. So what's unique about this hay feeding area? This here? hay feeding area was an old gravel pit, so it's always got a solid bottom. So so it doesn't we, get as, it still gets a little bit muddy probably. But well, yeah, just on top, you know, yeah. because of the hay waste and the manure. And you can keep that scraped off. So you're concentrating a lot of nutrients by feeding in one spot. How do you manage that? I pile them and let them set till we get their tobacco cut and then I start spreading manure. And during that time, they'll sort of compost. They won't truly compost, but it does reduce the volume and condenses the nutrient. And then you spread it back onto areas where? I spread it back onto areas where we got the annual rotation. Okay. So you're actually 
you're actually taking those nutrients and recycling those nutrients right. back onto areas where they're removing the nutrients right. from. And how do you feed your, your hay and your silage? I've got steel troughs for the silage, and then I've just got standard hay rings. They're, they're homemade, but in regular hay feeder to feed hay. Okay. Does that help reduce your losses, you think, feeding? I think that it's essential to put hay in a feeder. I think that it, if you don't put hay in the feeder, you're going to lose 50 or 60 percent of it. And if you have hay that is outside, you're still going to probably lose 30 percent because of the waste of it being setting out. I think if you've got good quality hay that's been in a barn, you're probably going to reduce that to 10 or 12 percent loss. Okay. I, I've seen them put this crabgrass out on dry ground in a hay feeder and they'll eat all of it. Just have essentially no waste. But you know, most of the time it gets muddy and the bottom of it gets kind of funky and you're gonna lose some. Okay. Now you can't see it on the camera, but there's a feeder wagon sitting right over there that is really good to feed hay in because it's got a bottom and it keeps it up off the ground. Something unique that you've done here with this barn is that you've used uh, a recycled- Barge lids. Barge lids, yeah, yeah. to help, to help uh, cover that hay. Has that worked pretty well? It works great. Tell me how you got the barge lids home because um, they're so wide, I have no idea how you, how you transported them home. Now, farmers are exempt on wide load permits. Okay. They're also exempt on the not pulling wide loads on weekend law. But some places you can't move a wide load on, on weekend. So we took a trailer, an 18 wheeler, 48 foot trailer to Columbus, Kentucky where they had these and loaded it on a Friday. And at daylight Sunday morning, we brought them home. They were 22 feet wide. They were high enough to uh, miss the mailboxes. Next up on the tour is the summer annual demonstration area. We've got five separate strips of different mixtures and summer annuals. Our first one is a legume mixture. It's got lots of different species in it. Our second strip, is what we call Chris's Crazy Mix. It's got 12 different species in it. Our third strip is a pearl millet. Our fourth strip is a BMR Sorghum Sudan grass. It happened to be the most tasty for the animals. They always went to that strip first. And then our last strip is a conventional Sorghum Sudan grass, just a good solid variety that you could get at your local farm store. We've got a nice demonstration here of how we can use summer annuals and grazing systems. So we've got a number of different treatments here. We've got a summer annual legume mix, and it's got a little bit of pearl melt and a little bit of crabgrass in with it, but we really focused on the legumes. We've got some unique legumes in here. We've got cow peas, that's right here, and then we've got a, a very unique legume. It's a summer legume called a um, sun hemp, and it's a tropical legume. And these legumes can supply nitrogen during the summer months to this mixture. This particular mixture right here has not had any nitrogen applied to it. And the crabgrass that's in this mixture along with the pearl millet still has a pretty good green color. So they're gaining some nitrogen from these legumes. Um, there's a little bit of root leakage when we use these summer annual legumes um, that will supply the companion grasses a little bit of uh, nitrogen. Not as much as you would, as, as if you would have put nitrogen on this field, but the legumes tend to do better when we don't apply nitrogen. One thing we, we wanted to mention was um, when forage gets taller like it is in here, so this is probably about four to five feet tall, um, we, we tend to get more trampling and more wastage of the forage. And there's always a debate on whether that's good or bad. And, um, from a utilization standpoint, it's bad. So we're not getting as much of the forage in the animal's stomach. So that's not ideal. From a soil health standpoint, it may not be a terrible thing because we do get a lot of residual or trampled forage on the soil surface. That helps to moderate the climate on the soil surface. It also provides habitat for everything else that lives in the soil, insects and bacteria and fungi and so forth. It provides a habitat for. So that's kind of a positive thing about um, leaving a little bit of residue on the soil surface. All right, so this is the, um, what we call Chris's Crazy Mix. It's got 12 different species of summer annuals in it. 
Um, I'm not going to list all those species, but it's got uh, grasses and it's got legumes and it's got forbs in it. Forbs are a broadleaf plant like a sunflower. Here's one right here that that doesn't fix nitrogen. So um, some of these species are more palatable than others. We've done some work with a graduate, one of my graduate students on campus, I uh, mean at the research station in Princeton. And what Kelly has found is that these, uh, this crazy mix did not have higher average daily gains than our simple mixture or our, our monoculture of the brown midrib, midrib sorghum sudan grass. So the question is, why would you plant a, a complex mixture like this? It is more expensive. It may have some other benefits that we don't fully understand, like creating habitat and food sources for other things in the soil, like um, maybe pollinators or uh, other species that live in the soil. Stacy, what do you think is your biggest limiting factor when it comes to, um, to uh, marketing? Yeah, I've, I've started doing lots of specialty stuff like snack sticks and summer sausage mm -hmm. and that type of thing. But that's your ground beef meat that you use for that. And that's been tough because it's hard to get people to come out to your farm, like say for us to drive from Paducah, if you don't have ground beef available. So just trying to keep the balance between your specialty stuff, your ground beef and your steaks. That's the hardest part for me. We use Laird's Meat Company at Benton and um, we have a standing appointment. We take two beef every other week. I work there when they process our beef. I do all the vacuum sealing and all that. That way I know I'm getting what I want. <laughs> if you don't make any specific claims like grass fed, you can have it approved at your local butcher. Okay. But if you make a claim, then it's got to go federal. It's got to be approved. But do you we have did grass fed on your We do not. We, we probably should, but we've never done that. Okay. But um, I designed our label. I wanted Kentucky Proud on it. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us on this year's uh, Summer Forge Tour at Michael and Stacy Palmer's. Especially want to thank Michael and Stacy for opening their farm up to the group today. We had a great meeting and great music after in a great grass finished burger and hot dog dinner. So if you have any questions about this conference, please get with your local extension agent and they'll be able to help you get them answered.